skip over that and just get into the message, if that's all right with you. I, I, I don't want you to miss the fact that you were just led by teenagers and kids in worship and that it is important we have always... Um, we have a senior pastor that has always invested some way, somehow, in children and, and teenagers' lives. And for that, af after being a youth pastor for 12 years, I, I can't say thank you enough to the two of you. For, for literally, I, I just, I want to give honor where honor is due, and it is appreciative. I'm not, I don't know what other churches do. What I do know is we have two senior pastors that have said, no, kids are important. Kids need to know the foundations. Kids need a relationship. They need to be able to experience. They need to see us worship. A lot of churches today, they, they just send the kids to the back and the parents do their thing. But we believe in allowing kids to see us, that it's okay to raise our hands, that it's okay to come down front, that it's okay to cry in the midst of worship, that it's okay to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that it's okay to speak in tongues, that it is okay. These things are of God, and they need to be fleshed out. And we want to create an atmosphere where everyone is safe to do that, especially these, these kids. It is a goal that we have it is a goal that we will continue to have to create an atmosphere and or an environment where everybody experiences the unconditional love of God. And so this morning, this morning, I, it, it, this is, I, to me, to be honest with you, I, I love that we get to do this. And I love that the teenagers that have been with me for the last couple of years and, and the kids that are getting ready to come to me, that, like, this is cool. It's awesome. It's fun. But more so, like, this is our future. To, to see teenagers and kids do this, and then it's not on Shelby, and, and it's not on Tammy, and it's not on me, but, like, we get to be led by teenagers while they, I mean, Pete said it best, they, they, there's a purity about that that we learn something from. As long as our eyes are open. As long as we're attentive to what the Holy Spirit is going on. And we, sometimes I, I, I get concerned that we walk in here and, and we look at church as just an event instead of a community. We, we look at church as a commodity that we buy into. And once that commodity drives up, we just move on and, and find a different one. And yet the Holy Spirit is always working, doing something in this community. And so no matter whether, I, I, whether I'm preaching, whether pastor's preaching, no matter whether you're lead, led by Shelby or Kelly or, or a bunch of teenagers, the Holy Spirit is at work right now. And that we have, a, we have something to do with that. That we actually have the ability to step in and be a part of what God is doing. Proverbs 22 uh, verse 6 says, Dedicate your children to God and point them in the way that they should go. Dedicate your children to God and point them in the way that they should go. And the values they've learned from you will be with them for life. The values they learn from you will be with them for life. What are the values you're teaching your kids today? What are the values that you're teaching the kids around you? They may not be your kid. They may not be your, your grandchild. They may not be your niece or your nephew. They may just sit by you every single Sunday. What are the values that you are instilling in these kids? Is it honesty? What about accountability? We don't really like accountability these days. We don't like our feet being held to the fire. Respect, empathy, determination. What about open communication? I have an 11 year old boy. Communication's been awkward. Gets, it, we get into different stages of life and you're talking about different conversations, but so many of us are like, hey, we'll have these conversations about this, but I don't really want to enter into that conversation because I don't know how I feel about it. No, no. What happened to just open communication, teaching these kids the values, teaching these kids a way of life? What about the value of community? The last four times, in some way, shape, or form, I've preached on community. It may have been the underlying message, like this morning, but community is a thing. Community is not something to just throw away or to, to be a part of when you feel like it. No, community it's always 
Community is exactly what the Bible talks about, that each and every single one of us has a role to play in this community. Years ago, before my time um, here, there was a lady named Eve Fenton who came into this church and gave a word. And that word was that we were going to be a place that prepared a way for people. Not just the unbelievers of this community, but the next generation. That we were going to prepare a way for this community. We were going to prepare a way. And I believe with all that I am that we are to prepare a way for this next generation. But I can't do it by myself. And pastor can't do it by his self. That each and every single one of us are preparing, cultivating a way for these kids to move forward. That we are to point them in the direction that they should go, the Bible says, right? But to point, we have to understand, is not to just, it's not the, the you sitting on your lazy boy and point and telling your kid to go get the remote for you. Listen, I, I do it all the time, right? Hampton, the remote's over there. I need you to get it for me. That's different than this. To point in the direction they should go is to have them walk with you. you this isn't a, hey, launch, um, and hey, 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 kids' church, there's your pretty room, and there's your fancy lights, and, and you get a, uh, an entire week dedicated to you, and you get to use the building on Wednesday nights, and, and, and you're going to get to go to camp, and it's going to be fantastic. No, 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 no. To point them in a direction is to be with them, to mentor them, to walk with them and say, hey, listen, I want to teach you something here. I want to teach you because every single one of us has a different, different perspective in life. Every single one of us has different things that we can teach these kids. I don't know everything, believe it or not. But the point to prepare a way to lead is to walk with them. What direction are you going this morning, adults? What is it in your life that's leading you? What are the things that you walked in here this morning that have your attention? What you have to understand is that if you're not leading them, these kids will improvise. If you aren't mentoring them, if you're not in relationship with them, they will improvise. A, a couple of years ago, I told you a story of Henley. Henley's our, our third child. And Henley, um, like from two to six months ago, was a kid that, it, like, if you couldn't, if you didn't hear him and didn't see him, you needed to be worried because you had no idea what was going on. And there was a day, I don't know where, where Heather was, but it was just me and the boys at home. And the older two, Hampton and Hezekiah, go upstairs. And they're going to play upstairs. And Henley, a couple of minutes later, says he wants to go upstairs. Well, Henley got upstairs and he saw his brothers coloring and drawing on a piece of paper. And he wanted to color and draw on a piece of paper, but, you know, Hampton and Hezekiah are too cool to just give his brother a piece of paper, right? So what's Henley do? Well, he finds a red permanent marker, <laughs> and he looks for paper, and he can't find paper. So he uses the back of our couch. Yeah, we still have the couch. It's a perfectly good couch. And it's upstairs for none of you people to see when you come over. <laughs> I walk upstairs, and I look at Henley, and Henley's just got this big old smile on his face and a red marker all over him and all over the couch. And you want to get mad, but it's not the kid's fault. He wasn't doing it to be mean. He's, he was like two and a half, three years old. He, he, doesn't, have, he doesn't have a malicious bone in his body. He just was having a good time. Kids will improvise. I realize that that is a very small story, but it is the truth. These teenagers will improvise not being led. James Comer once said, no significant learning can happen without significant relationship. No significant learning can happen without significant relationship. 
This shouldn't be a surprise to us Christians because our faith is based off an entire relationship with Jesus Christ. Without a relationship with Jesus Christ, there is no Christianity. We step into a relationship, and that relationship changes you and I's life, right? When you stepped into a relationship with Jesus, did it not change your life? Yes, the answer is yes to that wholeheartedly, and it continues to change every single day. So what better thing to do than to step into a relationship with a teenager who doesn't know up from down and has more hormones running through their body than you and I put together? If you don't believe it, read a book. It's, it's a thing. To step into a relationship, one of significance, not shallow, like, hey, how are you? Hey, uh, I'm going to walk the other way. No. How was your week? You got an F on a test? How'd your mom feel about it? How's your week? Well, to be honest with you, I felt like committing suicide. Oh, well, let's hash that out. How, how was your week? Well, I cut three times. Oh, let, let, let's talk about that. How, how was your week? felt God for the first time. Ah, how was your week? To be sitting with these teenagers, to be sitting with these kids. I told first service, we kind of, um, as, as adults, kind of fooey at the teenagers that think their life is so difficult, right? I'm the only one. You haven't ever looked at a teenager and said, life isn't that difficult, <laughs> right? I heard it from my mom all the time. I don't know if that's true, but she's right there. <laughs> you hear, right? Oh, this, you just have no idea, Pastor Sean, how hard life is. <laughs> it's like, Cameron, is Cameron here? Cameron, back, there, back in the back. Cameron's like, you have no idea how hard life is. Bro, I just spent like $500 on food for you. What are you talking about? Life is hard. <laughs> but I was listening to a, a country song the other day, and it's, it, it put this in perspective for me. The reality of it is, is that these teenagers are going through things that you and I haven't had to go through as teenagers. And they have because they have these little computers that we call cell phones sitting in their hands. And they are bullied on social media. Their life is on social media. And it may be that, um, that uh, we look at it as, well, it's your choice to be on that. Well, I mean, like, they're kids. So do you, you expect them to make the best choices? Again, the values thing, that, that, that first scripture, there, there's something to that, right? Oh, okay. Now listen to this this song from Sam Hunt the other day. I wouldn't consider it country, but it was talking about um, being easy to be being broke up with in the 90s. You know what song I'm talking about? Yeah, as Zeke knows. I bet it was easy being broken up with in the 90s. And the point of the song is that today... This guy was broken up with by this girl, and he gets on social media, and he sees that old girl's already with another guy. And in the 90s, you and I didn't have social media. We, we had phones that you had to sit in the living room and talk to your girlfriend or your boyfriend while your mom was sitting next to you, and it was awkward. <laughs> but guess what we're teaching our boys today? They're going to sit in the living room. You talk on the phone, even if it is a cell phone, right by mom. They are under a pressure that it, you're right, they don't have bills to pay. You're right, they, they, don't, they don't understand the weight of, of adulthood. But I don't know that we understand the weight of, of teenage years anymore. And, and the, the more you spend time with these kids... The more you're in relationship with these kids, the more you have the ability to speak to what it is that they're going through. Not, not always being sympathetic, learning how to be empathetic, and then talk when they're actually listening, because that's a thing too. It is in relationship between young and old that the body of Christ works best. Acts 2, 17 and 18 um, says this is, uh, this is what will, 
This is what I'll do in the last days. I'll pour out my spirit on everybody and cause your sons and your daughters to prophesy. Can you imagine our teenagers and our young kids in the sanctuary right now prophesying? That may be weird to you. It's not to me. I long for that day. I want that day. I want the day where your young men will see visions and your old men will experience dreams from God. That the Holy Spirit will come upon all servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. I long and so badly want to grow a community where each and every single one of us are hearing from God, speaking to God, speaking with God, and that Every single one of us are listening, and it is not about just the adults doing it, but it is about your young people doing it as well. And it is not just a Wednesday night thing or a Sunday morning back in kit, but to be able to come into a room like this, to be able to worship God, to be able to praise God with our kids and our teens and allow them to see visions and allow us older individuals to experience dreams that we know exactly where it is that we're going, exactly what God wants to do, that it's not a a goosebump feeling that, oh, I think that was God, but no, he is speaking to, with, for, and from. But we've got to lead them. We've got to lead them. You lead them in relationship. If you read the books of Timothy, Paul does a really great job of leading or of, of laying out how to lead young people. See, Timothy was a teenager. And Timothy wasn't just a teenager, but he was a pastor. He wasn't just a pastor, he was the pastor of the largest church in Ephesus. And Paul is is speaking to him. And he says, "I, I need to remind you, and I want to encourage you, of a couple of things. 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 14 says, Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth. If there are youth in here, and there is, let no one despise you for your youth. Let no one despise you for your youth. God has spoken. God will continue to speak. God will continue to open your eyes to things. Speak those things. Talk about those things. Do not hold back just because you are a teenager, just because you are a a quote-unquote kid. What is God speaking to you? But set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture and exhortation um, to teaching. And do not neglect the gift you, you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. These teenagers today need encouraged. We need to encourage these kids around us. We need to encourage them to help hold their heads up high. We need to encourage them that, they, that God is speaking to them. We need to encourage them that they are hearing from God. These kids need to be encouraged. Ephesians um, 6 verse 4 says, Fathers, don't exasperate your children, but raise them up with loving discipline and counsel that brings the revelation of the Lord. The footnotes to this uh, scripture are perfect. In other words, fathers show um, fathers should show consideration for different levels of understanding and experience that their children possess, dealing with them at their level. Dealing with them at their level. Is this not the Jesus that we serve? Is it not the Jesus that we have come in contact with that he deals with us at our level? level. We see Jesus doing this, whether he's laying or sitting in the dust, uh, uh, speaking to a woman or sitting at a table, speaking to Zacchaeus, who is hated, right? He sits at our level and speaks to us on our level. He still does it today, does he not? He spoke to you this morning at your level, does he not? We are called to speak to these kids at their level. 
We would like their level to be up here with us. But the reality of it is, is that can't be happening right now. And so we need to drop down and speak to them. We need to get in the dust of what is going on in their life and allow them to be vulnerable, allow them to be open, allow them to be raw, and allow them a way forward in his name is Jesus Christ. Paul is writing to Timothy, encouraging him, stay the course. I realize life is difficult. Stay the course. I realize you don't quite get it. Stay the course. I realize you got grounded for a stupid reason. Stay the course. Regardless of your youth, keep moving forward. Regardless of your youth, be an example. Regardless of your youth, I know you can do this. I've got, I've got your back. These teenagers... <laughs> They don't need pretty. They need authentic. When I was younger, we were enamored by the lights and the smoke and the music. These kids are enamored by authenticity. It's why when a kid comes over here and experiences Jesus, he, she just wants to know how to do it again. She just wants to know how... how how, how, how do I get to experience that again? Because I didn't even want to leave the building. I just wanted to stay here. I, I tell the, the youth workers uh, all the time, hey, um, so when, when you go to work with these, this youth group, when you go to work with these, uh, the, these kids, just whatever you do, just be honest with them. They're like, what are you talking about? Like, no, I need you to, like, if they ask you a Bible question and you're the adult in the room and you think you should know the answer, but you don't, just say, I, I don't. Let's talk to someone else. Why? These kids want to believe in Jesus, and they're doing it through you. They experience Jesus first and foremost on how you experience Jesus, which is why it's important that these kids are in here watching us. It's why it's important that these kids are in here seeing us come down to the front, seeing us pray for one another. It's important because, okay, now we can kind of experience that, and we can kind of try and, and, and step into that. No, I, these kids don't need pretty. These kids need authenticity. I've said I've been a youth pastor for 12 years now. And I've said this for as long as I've been a youth pastor. You want to see a church on fire for God? Allow the kids to experience. You want to see a community turned upside down on its head? Allow the kids to do something in the community. Why? Because there is something that is beautiful and powerful about a teenager who is on fire for God. And when a few teenagers are on fire for God, they'll move mountains compared to an entire congregation of adults. Why? It's not that we suck. It's that they don't care. They just love Jesus. And so they'll stand up here and they'll dance. I, I mean, I, I hate to say this, but there's very few of us that would do that. We love Jesus. I would never question your love for Jesus. But we don't love Jesus that much. Maybe that's a little harsh, and I, I almost apologize. But the reality of it is, is that God does something in our lives when we are free, when we are abandoned of the, the chains and the walls, when we, we care less about what's going on in our lives and more about what God is speaking to us. And that's what you see in Izzy. That's what you see in these teenagers. That's what you see in these kids. They're doing dance moves. Listen to me. Listen to me. I don't hardly do them in the back. I'm as, I'm as much to blame here as anybody. Have you ever seen me dance? There's a reason for it. <laughs> Six foot four, two lots, dancing. You don't want to see that. No one wants to see that. Hi. Next Sunday, I'll dance for you, Q. <laughs> the way to lead them is to encourage them. 
It's to love them. And it's to give them grace to fail. No one likes that word. I'm teaching these 11-year-old baseball kids who are so soft how to fail. Because somewhere along the way, whether it be parents, whether it be nature versus nurture, I don't know, and I'm not interested in finding out. What I do know is that they don't think that it's okay to fail at 11 years old. What are you talking about? I don't know what you think, but what I think is I've learned more from my failures in life and where God is in that failure than I have from any success in my life. And I have these kids that strike out. We had a kid, do you guys know what an RBI is? Run batted in? I'm going to teach you about baseball. <laughs> he had a kid score a run yesterday, but because he got out, he cried. And like literally cried. He didn't get on base. But buddy, you didn't fail. You see that as a failure, but it was a success. There's beauty in that. There's grace in that. You moved the community. You moved the team forward. Like we are, that's what I love about baseball. Baseball is based off of sacrifice. There isn't any other sport that, that there is a column um, that is a positive for sacrifice, like baseball. Sack fly, sack bunt, RBIs. Like there, there it runs bad. Like there, it's beautiful. There's something beautiful about the game. But this is how we move the community forward. Learning from each other's failures. Learning from, ah, I see where you're going with that. Ah, I see. But it's okay. You're not going to be perfect. You're not going to play a perfect game. You're not going to play a perfect game at life. And that is okay. Why? Because we believe in a God who never leaves and never forsakes we believe in a God who says we are perfect. We believe in a God who says, it's okay, I'm with you. Let's do it again. It's okay, I'm with you. Let's do it again. It's okay, I'm with you. Parents, adults, grandparents, aunts, uncles, we need those people in these kids' lives. It's okay, get up and do it again. It's okay, get up and do it again. It's okay, you know the foundations. Get up and do it again. Instead, sometimes we get so hard on these kids. Why would you ever think about doing that? How dare you do that? No, no, no. One of the very first verses, I remember my mom um, speaking to us often, is First Timothy um, 1, verse 6 and 7. And when I read it, you'll, you'll know the verse, uh, most of you. But I want to talk to you teenagers as I start to close. I want to talk to you teenagers about this verse. The, the 6th through 12th graders that are in here. The verse says, For this reason I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God, which is in you, through the laying on of hands. For God gave us not a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of self-control. Paul reminds Timothy of four qualities. First one, courage. It takes courage to be a Christian. Somewhere along the way, we have taught that if you become a Christian, life is going to be rainbows and unicorns. But it is not. It's not at all. It takes courage to be a man or a woman of service. Isaiah 41.10 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Deuteronomy 31.6, we've said it multiple times already this morning. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you and he will never forsake you. It takes courage to be a Christian. But the beauty of it is, is that courage is with you right now. His name is Jesus. Number two, power. You are getting ready to step in, some of you, into a season of life that is difficult. That is, and it's difficult because it's new. 
It's difficult because you got to get up for a 7.30 class on a Tuesday. Like, why in the world would anybody schedule a 7.30 class on a Tuesday if you're in college? It's crazy. I know. It, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's a thing. We have the ability, we have power to come face to face with life's challenges and win. Why? Because even in our weakness, we are strong according to the word. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That is so contrary to the world that we live in today. For my power is made perfect in weakness, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I will delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We have power. Number three, love. It's love that gives Christians all these other qualities. You want power, you want courage, you want self-discipline, patience, joy, the ability to speak in tongues, the gifts of the Spirit. You got to learn to love. 1 Corinthians 13 says you can have everything. You can have all the knowledge in the world. You can have all the wisdom. You can have all the possessions of the world, but if you do not have love, it means nothing. In a culture today that is so fixated on knowing everything, that is so fixated on, on all, getting all of these material things and all these possessions, so it fills the voids in our lives. We are called to love, and we have to show these kids what that looks like. And number four, self-control. There's an untranslatable Greek word Sophronismus. One theologian de defined it as a sanity of saintliness. Kids, let me tell you something. There isn't an adult in here that doesn't so struggle with self control. I know you do, but so does every adult sitting around you. That's the thing. When I'm best at that, is when my prayer life is strong. self-control, self-discipline comes from a strong prayer life. Why? Because I'm not swayed by my thoughts. I'm swayed by His. You guys can go. How do I prepare a place for this next generation? How do we prepare a place for this next generation? We encourage them. We lead them. We point them in the direction that they should go. And we walk with them. This is not something you can do from the sidelines. This is not something you can do from the sidelines. Whether you have kids in this church or not, you got to jump in. You got to step into a relationship. I promise you, it'll change your life just as much as it'll change the kids. That if you've ever experienced a baby dedication here, um, a couple of things happen, and all of it is very important. It's 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 very important that you dedicate your child in the house of God. And what'll happen is, Pastor um, will stand here, and the family will, will come around the mom and the dad, and depending on the temperament of the child will depend on whether or not pastor holds the child at that moment. And he looks at the mom and dad. He says, will you raise this child to know Jesus? He prays for that child, that if it would be God's will that he would marry a man or a woman, the new Jesus, that they would have kids, that they would continue 
to lead their family in a godly manner. And then he looks at the family standing around. The grandparents, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, well, all the stuff, right? And he looks at me and says, hey, so this is going to be hard. And they're going to need your help. Will you help them? And of course, all of the family looks at pastor and says, well, yeah, of course, we will be there. We'll help. When it's long nights and the kid is crying for no reason, or the, the tough nights as teenage years, and we've made mistakes, will you, will you help them? Yes, of course. And then at that point in time, he'll hold the child, and he'll turn around and he'll ask you to stand. And he says, this child is going to watch you. This child is going to watch how you walk. This child is going to want to know what it means to be a Christian, and he's going to look at you, or she's going to look at you on how to do that. Will you be an example for these kids and these teenagers to know what it means to have a relationship with Jesus? And we all stand there and shake our heads. Yes, yes, I will do that. We need that right now we need that today we don't need that in the next baby dedication we'll get that at the next baby dedication I know we will I've been here 12 and a half years and every single time we de de dedicate a baby you're like yes because you understand it you know it you know it to be true I'm telling you we have a group of kids young and old teenagers all the way down to weeks old the need to know what it means to be in a relationship with Jesus and they're trying to find that through you because you see you're sitting here on a Sunday morning you're sitting here in an atmosphere where you can discover God where you can develop that relationship with God and they're trying to figure out what that looks like so they can have the experience down here now she's got it and she wants it I, she doesn't need you very much she just needs Jesus but I need to get them to this point and I need your help doing it I can't do this alone. Pastor can't do this alone. Heather can't do this alone. I have to have you. It's part of being in a community. We each and every single one of us have a role. And that role is to not just sit on the sidelines, but, but to be in relationship with one another. Will you help me lead these kids? figure out how the Holy Spirit works in their life. To realize that even when stuff goes awry, Jesus is still there with open arms. <laughs> Saying it's going to be okay. I'll show you. granddad uh, knowing what's going through your head. How? It's a great sermon, John. How? Rachel Kelly, stand up. Come here. Come here. Everybody loved Izzy? Everybody loved Izzy? How many loved watching Izzy? That's why. That's why. I know that they play the piano and sing at home around that piano. I know that 45 Sundays out of the year, they're going to be sitting right there. I know he's going to be playing the piano over there. I know Rachel's going to be helping the kids in the back. because of those two. Yeah, we're, we're giving him the gift, but let me tell you who did it. He preached a great sermon. How? Because they raised their kids to know Jesus. 
I know how hard mom is on these kids. Now, I know I'm missing parents and you graduated kids. I, I, I'm missing a lot of you. But I've pastored for 35 years. And do you know that children are weapons of mass destruction? Children are weapons of mass destruction. I can prove it to you. Psalm 127 says that children are arrows in the hands of warriors. Children are arrows in the hands of warriors. Listen, in 1989, Annie and I had a prophetic word from Dick Mills that said, happy is the man whose quiver is full. The arrows are in the hands of do you know that if we prepare our children correctly, they become weapons of mass destruction for the devil in the future? And that the only way you can do that is to invest your life in your children. It says, happy is the man. And the way you do that is you commit to a community that's committed to raising children and you're all children in the image and the likeness of God so that they walk in love with God and God with them. That is not a two-week process. That's not a year. That takes 18 years. 18. Listen, I've got a son back here that's 40. I'm not sure who was having the best time. Him, Dayton, or Izzy. And I know that he's right behind him. I can remember when Pete just started playing the drums. This is a lifetime. And I'm serious. When I turn around and hold that child up and say, if you don't want to do this, go away. And I'm very serious. If you do not want to live a life that a child can emulate in the kingdom of God and not of the world, go away. Because it's more important to me to emulate in front of God Jacob so that Jacob knows that that's more important to me than whether or not the programs and seats or anything's full. I know I've lived my life in such a way that children worship the Lord freely. It is my hope to see Sean dance across front of this stage. It is my hope. Right? It is. Because we abandon ourselves to everything but to the only thing. There's only Him. So thank you as being parents who bring your children to church, who show them right and wrong on Tuesday night when they could do this and you say no. Thank you because it is parents, parents that commit to the reality that it's not just Sunday morning, but it's Thursday night. You could watch that show that says that language, but you say no. You could listen to that music that uses four-letter words, but you say no. <laughs> and grandparents, can I tell you something? I have more influence on his kids than he does. Can I tell you something? Because grand grandchildren think grandparents know everything. We're the ones buying them the ice cream when mom. It's a community, right? So thank you. Stand this morning. Why do we come to the table? Because I got to tell you, I come to the table every week to say thank you to my father who has never turned his back on me. I come to say thank you to the one who sent his son that I might be adopted. Come to say thank you. Do me a favor this morning, guys. You don't need the gloves. Let them take the host. You can wear the mask if you desire, but you can take the hose. They can take the hose. They can dip it, right? We, we, I just made an executive decision. You can, 